in testing, I find that I really need to practice more. Hello there viewers, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Forza Versus. Today we have a closely matched pair that walk different paths. First up is the 1997 Mazda RX-7, also known by the chassis code, the FD3S. The RX-7 was Mazda's entry into the Japanese sports market to fight with the likes of Toyota Supra or Nissan Skyline. The RX-7 is like its market opponents in that it features six combustion chambers and turbines to help the engine along. But unlike a normal car, the RX-7's engine is a rotary. That means it uses a bank of two triangular shaped paperweights buzzing about in an oval case that burns fuel like a two-stroke. The upshot of this is that it's just 1.3 litres of capacity makes 260 horsepower and sounds I suppose unique is a nice way of putting it. The engine is complete with sequential twin turbochargers and has been placed to bring a perfect 50-50 weight balance to the car. With the 9000 RPM redline, there's lots of legs to stretch as you throw it through corners. It's a pleasant thing to look at and with rounded edges and the only real problem with this design is that it's a little tight inside. I'm 6 foot 2 and having sat in one I was surprised that my kneecap was at the 3 o'clock position on the steering wheel. I didn't want to shut the door for fear of crushing my leg. Going up against the RX-7 today is a completely different car. It loses the turbos, does away with the rotary, and... Yes, this is a 1997 Mazda RX-7 with a 5.8 litre V8 swapped into it. To keep things fair, I elected to go with typical modifications on both cars. Performance street tyres rather than semi-slicks, slightly lowered suspension, upgraded roll bars, and minor engine parts like pod filters and exhausts, with better spark plugs and better brakes. The V8 received an uprated camshaft to compete against the rotary's bigger turbo and intercooler, but the handling adjustments were kept the same. We want to see if the different engines make all that much difference to how the already decent platform feels. The shorter answer is, surprisingly, yes, but not as you'd expect. The V8 manages to beat the rotary on power by 125 horsepower, and of course, the torque is in the V8's favour. Weight, however, is not in the V8's favour. The engine puts 66 kilos of extra metal up front and breaks the 50-50 weight balance, giving a result of 52 to 48 toward the front. These figures put the V8 at 296 brake horsepower to tonne, compared to the rotary's 216. In testing, I find that this difference is marginal on the track, with less than a second separating both cars. Ultimately, the wind went to the rotary. Its silky smooth delivery of power and the grip of the supplied tyres were able to keep up with the engine, resulting in something of a restrained performance. While the engine may have screamed, the car didn't feel unsettled, and I could only really complain about the gear ratios feeling a bit wrong for the track. The V8 was a different kettle of fish. It had the power to accelerate harder and the torque to hold gears while lower in the revs when cornering, but with an extra weight on the front, traction was problematic. The tail was a little too happy to step out of line, and at the level of tuning the rotary felt more of a complete package. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as they say. If more mods were poured onto them, the V8 opens itself up to many options like different charging styles, and notably, adjustments to the gearbox would bring that power back to being a usable number, rather than just a bigger number. So on to the scoring. I give the rotary an 8. I liked how the car felt, and it goes to show the unusual engine design was a carefully made choice rather than just being screwed in on a whim. It's a friendly car to drive, though it could be called somewhat bland. The rotary is a quirky thing, but there is a lot of potential to be had if you do it right. For the V8, I'm going to settle on a 6. The idea of putting an LS into it has been done to death, and I'm sure keyboard warriors are glaring at me over the top of their cups of Haterade, but the popularity of the swap doesn't lie. The V8 is a building block which lends itself to options, and love it or hate it, people have been fitting them into anything they can. From Sylvia's to Skylines, drift cars and drag weapons, 
the robust V8 is almost ubiquitous. I didn't like that it was a bit much motor and not enough chassis in this car's case, but with what's been done, it's incomplete. So that's the score. The rotary comes out from its disadvantages to be an understated pleasure. While the V8 was a fun experiment, it lacks a certain something in its very soul. It becomes just another car with yet another V8. I've been Patreo, and I thank you for watching Forza vs. on Sven TV. Let us know what you'd like to see next time, but until then, enjoy the drive. But unlike a normal car there, yeah. and yeah, unlike a normal car, my ass. We want to see if the different engines make all that much difference. In testing, I find that I really need to practice more. Ultimately, the wind went to the rotary. Its silky smooth delivery of tower. Delivery of tower? Okay. The rotary is a quirky thing, but there is a lot of potential to be had. Uh, let's try to gap. <coughs> The idea of putting LS into it has been done to death, and I'm sure keyboard warriors are glowering at me. Glowering? Glowering? Yeah. <clears throat> the V8 is a building block which lends itself to options, love it or hate it. People have been fitting them into anything they can, from Sylvia's to Skylines, drift cars and drag weapons. The robust... Robust? From Sylvia's to Skylines, drift cars and drag weapons. The robot... Robot V8? I didn't like that it was a bit much motor and not enough chassis. Yeah. I didn't like that it was a bit much motor and not enough chassis in these cars. But... Yeah.